Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn de Weyer and this is The Lingon, Exploring Ireland's Oldest Frontier, Part 2. Now last week I began this two-parter of exploring one of the most ancient frontiers in Ireland, the Lingon Valley. This episode continues that story and brings you further down the valley into more recent history. The first stop in this episode is at a place called Kilcash, which is only a mere 800 years old, which is pretty recent compared to what we talked about last week. And then the show finishes at a 1798 battlefield. In these episodes recorded in the Lingon Valley, I'm joined by Neil Jackman, who's an expert on the area. Now, if you want to find out more about the Lingon Valley, I would strongly recommend checking out tua.ie. This is a service Neil operates that has online lectures and itineraries so you can find your way around historic and archaeological landscapes like the Lingon and other amazing places across Ireland. That website is tua.ie. Now today's episode starts at a place called Kilcash, a pretty famous medieval church and castle. In our conversation though, Neil touches on lots of topics, everything from how medieval Ireland was more influenced by international trends than you might imagine, right down to how gunpowder made castles obsolete. So we've arrived at Kilcash, mm-hmm. church and castle. This is further south down the valley, really, is it? Yeah, we're actually just on... I, don't, I wouldn't know if we're technically even on the Lingon Valley as such now. We're just on the hinterland, just okay. at the very edge of it. But I thought it was an interesting place to come and look at because you kind of got two big stories here about slightly later periods in, yep. in than we've experienced so far. Um, we're here at the moment at the church of Kilcash, and it's quite an interesting little one. And again, it's one of those places which is very much overlooked, not really yep. visited. A lot of people would pass this by on the road and they might see the castle from the road, but few would know that there's this little lovely Romanesque church here. Now, the Romanesque period, you know, as we were talking about briefly there before, you're looking around about the 12th century. A lot of change actually happens in an island society in the 12th century. So it moves from, uh, it moves into a kind of diocesan system the church, the Irish church, it becomes more regulated and in line with the rest of Europe. So you end up with kind of bishoprics and and things like that. And you get the diocese then of Ossery becomes the diocese and all of this kind of thing. So Ireland's way of practicing Christianity in a way is becoming more uh, in line with the, the broader church. And that's why we call this kind of architecture Romanesque as well, because it's reflecting what you would see on the continent more so than what has been here before. Well, the organisation of the church is changing. Yeah. It's physical appearance. It's f- that if you're going to mass at the time, yeah. you can see that change play out. Yes, in and very small communities, or very yeah, small is the wrong word, but like yeah. in very local communities, I suppose is what I'm saying. A- absolutely, and and along with that as well. So we're talking here, kind of that happens synod of Rathbrazil, I believe, in about 1111, right? And churches like this, you start to see them more commonly by the middle of the 12th century, by 1150, 1160, 1170. But at that time as well, you start to get the continental monastic orders coming into Ireland as well, particularly the Cistercians. So not only is the practice of belief and religion and Christianity changing, but the Cistercians bring in new farming techniques. They bring in new ways of work in the land. So even the landscape begins to change at this this time as well. This has all happened though in advance of the Norman invasion, which obviously yes. begins in, in around the year 1170. Yes. But there is these changes happening that, to a degree, facilitate the much broader changes that take place in the aftermath of the Norman invasion, obviously, when yeah. land wholesale passes from the Gaelic Irish into the hands of the Normans. Yes. But some of that change highlighted in actually a building like this yeah. is already just being eased in I suppose for want of a better term. Exactly people are looking outwards and they're looking at outwards in a way that they necessarily didn't take on as much before. You always had movement right even in the early forms of Christianity even in the Neolithic that we saw earlier you know you'd see similar types of passage to Martin Brittany and the Iberian Peninsula as you would here in Ireland. So movements had always happened and particularly in Christianity Irish monks went to the continent and to Britain 
um, and, and vice versa, they came here too. But now you start to see a more kind of hierarchical, more kind of organisational change. And much like we saw with the high crosses in, in it being an expression of sort of the power or the tastes, if you like, of the patron, you start to see that with these Romanesque churches as well. This is, I'm not some backward little king only looking at my own place. I'm looking outwards and I'm acting like a French king would. Okay. Uh, I'm acting like, you know, somebody like that. So, I, and even, you know, I had an interesting discussion there with Tiger Keith as well that you might see Motten Baileys and there are actually quite a few around the Lingon Valley. There's these great earthen mounds where a wooden castle would be placed on top and there was a defensive enclosure around them called the Bailey. And that's typically seen as, as a very Norman invention. That's part of their expansion and conquest if you like, of these parts of Ireland. But some of those mots actually might be pre-Norman. These are the oh, okay. first version of the Irish castles, if you like. And one of the first places, or the most notable places you might see that is the Furrow on the Hill of Tara. Okay. You know, that might be one. Uh, there might be another one at, uh, you know, the, the, there's a couple of candidates. There's another one maybe in Kilfinnan and Limerick and, and things like that too. So people like Brian Brew, for example, uh, who died in 1014 at Clontarf, he was already looking to Europe yep. for ideas. That only accelerates when we get into the 12th century. And a church like this is a real expression of that. And th the main way that you would know a Romanesque church when you come into one is, is always the very ornate, fabulous doorways that they have, which we, which we just walked yeah. through. This one here is a little bit weathered. Yep. It's made out of sandstone, but when you go to some of the better preserved ones, say like the Nuns Church at Clamart Nice or Dysart or Dee down in County Clare, you can see they're covered in like human heads, animal heads, chevrons and zigzags. They're in the most flamboyant uh, pieces of stone architecture, I think, it, it, on the island in a sense. They really are incredible. And it's interesting to see that expression of art, European identity and all of that right here in the quiet little Lingon Valley. This church is probably a lot smaller though than people at home might think. Yeah. The, 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 the building itself, I'm trying to compare it to something that people might be able to imagine, but it's... It'd be like I, a very big cottage. Yeah, it wouldn't be yeah. too much out of yeah. the way of kind like of You're not going to have more than, cottage. I don't know, you're going to have less than 100 people in here in terms of even if everyone is standing kind of thing. Quite possibly. Not everyone was probably allowed inside in a sense as yeah. well. You're probably looking at a kind of a higher rank of society and such, and of course the clergy and the whatever, you know, people are serving that here as well. It's separated by a, a, a large wall into two. So you've got the chancel end, which is where, you know, the priests and, and so on would be performing the mass and the nave end, which is where the common people would be or the, the, the local populace would be. But this looks, when you look at it, doesn't it look like it's been inserted in a later time? You can see it's not yeah. quite flush with the original structure okay. and things like that. Yes. So yeah, yeah. It, it's always interesting, I think, coming looking at a building like this, because in one sense, when you first see it, you might think it's telling one story of one period, but you look closely and you start to see where windows have been blocked up and doors have been changed. And what you're seeing then is an expression of continuity and change and reapplication over a very long period of time. Similar enough to what we were talking about at the very start back at, uh, at, at Rimrock Row. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. do we know when this building would have been, do we have a date for this? Or so, is it a so uh, with, you'd be probably looking in the second half of the 12th century. So I'd say somewhere from about 1150 to probably about 1180, Please. give or take, something around that sort of way. So a few hundred years on from a last <laughs> site in a henny. What's really nice as well is you've got some really interesting headstones here oh, from yeah. the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. Yeah. Looking Carries, at this one yeah. here, this is from, can we see the date? 1752. 52? 52 or 32. But it's got the depiction of the uh, crucifixion, but it's got all the symbols of the passion there as well. So you can see the scourge where Jesus yeah. was whipped with. You can see the lance that he oh, used. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, normally they display the dice. Yeah, there's the dice that they uh, threw for Jesus's clothes and all of this. And it's a really kind of charming little bit of kind of folk art in a way. Yeah. So again, when you're looking at these historic churchyards and graveyards, um, have a look for these smaller features too that can sometimes be easily overlooked. I think it's quite interesting. 
Speaking of graves, there is one particular grave mm -hmm. down here that yes. uh, you mentioned in the car on the way over. Yeah. Uh, who is where you, or who is this? And I suppose that leads us on to the castle that's not too far from here as well. Well, it does. It, it's the Butler Mausoleum, actually. So the Butlers were an incredibly powerful family in Kilkenny and most famously associated, of course, with Kilkenny Castle. Yeah. So they owned all of this as well. Uh, they, they're a huge powerhouse. This is after the Norman con conquest, I should say, to yeah. people at home. So that the, the first butler comes in just after the conquest. He comes in with, um, I think he comes over with John, with, think, John, uh, either yeah. John or, or Henry, yeah. He comes in a little bit later when the hard work's done. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And uh, he is, um, he rises to power, essentially, um, he, they get the name Butler because he was the chief cupbearer, the ceremonial cupbearer to, to the king, you know, which yep. was a very prestigious position at the time. Um, so the mausoleum is here. Now, the, the, most of the medieval butlers you would find buried either in St. Canis' Cathedral mm. in Kilkenny or in Gowran yeah, 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 yeah. in uh, St. Mary's. There's a lovely tomb actually uh, there. It was one of the early butlers actually from the 14th century. It's been a while since I've been in here now. Actually, <laughs> this is the uh, blocked up joke. Um, but yes, the, the mausoleum, essentially, what it is, it's um, where the... You've got a few generations of the butlers in there, including Margaret Butler, who died in 1744. And she's uh, the one who... You know, there's that very famous lament. I, as okay. I say, unfortunately, I can't do the <laughs> Irish version of it. But the first couple of lines, now what will we do for timber with the last of the woods laid low? You know, which is, people take as kind of an expression of not only the kind of the loss of the generations of the butlers in a particularly pivotal time in Irish history in the 18th century, but also with the last of the woodlands essentially being yeah. cleared out at that time. Uh, the last of Ireland's great oaks and things like that were being harvested for the Royal Navy, essentially, yeah. to be turned into ships and, and building materials, you know. Um, so she's in there along with uh, Colonel Thomas Butler. And, you know, when, when we go along to the castle, we'll, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about them and, and how their fortunes kind of rose and fell, so to speak, in this area. But yeah. yeah. Do we head up? So we've come about 200 metres up from the church. And now we're looking at a tower house uh, which with one of the great features of uh, Irish historical sites, a danger keep out sign. But uh, <laughs> Neil, do you want to tell us uh, what we're looking at here? It's a pretty spectacular tower house in terms of it's, it's a lot bigger than many you'd see. And then it has yeah. a, what I assume is a modern addition at some point built onto it. But yeah, do you want to tell us uh, what we're looking at here? Yeah, again, uh, this is an exp expression in a way of us being on a borderland, a frontier land here, because as you drive around this bit along kind of Waterford, Tipperary, Kilkenny, you see so many tower houses in the landscape. This is one of dozens within a fairly short stretch of countryside. I believe it's an island the most castellated country oh, okay. per, per square mile or something like that. It's, it, it's certainly up there anyway in Europe. So this was built originally by the Wall family in the 15th century, but it passed to the butlers by the middle of the 16th century, by about 1540. I might just get you to explain exactly so, uh, physically what, what's in front of us for, for listeners. So essentially a, a tower house, it, it's like the name kind of it, it expresses, it's essentially a castle in just a tower form. So rather than it having big battlements going all the way around and all the rest of it and curtain walls, it's focused very much into... I think that's probably about five stories high. It has uh, called matriculations at the corners, so people could, you know, defensive features at the corners and the upper floors and things like that. At the bottom of it, you would enter, and, and the Great Hall would be, I think, generally on the first or the second floor, and then there's accommodation for the family in the one above. So it's, they're not uncommon in Ireland. This, as you say, is a particularly large one, though. Um, and they were the homes, really, of the wealthy Irish elites. And by this stage, the butlers were Irish as, as such, you know, yeah. by the 16th century that we're talking about here, and the walls as well. So um, this would have been kind of, it would have been surrounded 
a, a, a sort of a, a smaller version of a curtain wall in a sense that would have been kind of protecting the outer bats but when we look at this one now we can see that there's a shell essentially just one wall left of another structure that was added probably in the 17th century by the looks of that or maybe even the early 18th century somebody told me i don't know how accurate this is but somebody told me this was used when the butlers had it as something of a pleasure house so if they were looking to the young butler men were looking okay. to take courtesans away for a bit of hunting and a bit of a, a laugh and, and and so on this would be discreetly away from kilkenny and the prying eyes of the family that they could come up here for a bit of a party yeah for sure by the 17th century it had largely gone as okay. I, by the 18th century it was, it was fairly in ruins and it was sold to the state for 500 pounds in relatively recently okay. uh, relatively recently i'll have to check my notes on that one and over the last kind of oh, 20 years i think it's been completely covered in scaffolding there's been since it's been in the hands of the opw in the state they've been doing a huge job trying to conserve the building they now look to be on the last stages of that now unfortunately it's still locked uh, and it's still kind of inaccessible for us today but um yeah it, it's is the plan you know to open it to the public or i would hope so i would hope so i mean it looks in, in pretty good fettle now i don't know what it's like on the inside but the yeah. outside certainly looks in good condition yeah um so it, it was really after 1758 so it's really mid middle 18th century that this place started to fall into kind of disrepair i yeah. suppose that coincides and maybe we can talk more about it at the final site we're going to go to but in the emergence, I suppose, of what we call modern history, late 18th, 19th century, yeah. you've got lots of changes in terms of the administration of Ireland, but also yeah. in terms of building and uh, techniques and things like that. Yeah. And tower houses, whilst they might be good in terms of defensive structures, they're not very uh, homely. No. They're, I would imagine, very hard to heat. Uh, they tend to have spiral staircases, which are not easy to, tra to traverse, particularly no. for people who might be elderly or injured or whatever. Yeah. So you can easy see why the butlers if they have the resources to do it are going to start moving to more um quote unquote modern houses now what i mean is a house that would be two three hundred years old today yeah, yeah. but maybe starting to 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 represent or to be reminiscent of a contemporary housing and that would have you know mm -hmm. maybe two three floors that's right yeah. uh, staircases that are straight things like that well that's it i mean essentially the good points of a tower house its defensiveness is essentially became obsolete by that stage as well because of the improvement in cannon okay. and things like that you know it's so like this can be demolished quite easily if needed exactly and many were you know yeah. by by uh, especially in the 17th century uh, during the confederacy wars and during kind of cromwell's uh time you know so the good aspects of it the positives then quickly got fell away and, and the negatives as you said the yeah. practicalities trying to go up a spiral staircase if you're pregnant trying to you know navigate it if you're you know elderly or infirm and you can see the change towards that now when we look at that building to the side with its big windows again yep. that's as we've been talking all the time there's change uh, there's continuity but there's change too and th this is more looking like a kind of yeah late tudor kind of coming into the 1600s 1700s kind of manner and actually a really good place to see that where it's all intact is say Donegal Castle oh, yeah, where you yeah, have a yes. big tower house on yeah. one side and you have the ruins then of like a, a late kind of Tudor sort of mansion attached to the side of it because defense goes out of the window yeah because it's got to see look, looking at what's remained it's only really one wall but what's yeah. remained it obviously had no defense capabilities at no. all there's three huge windows on the ground floor yeah. and then three huge windows on the first floor yeah it's clearly not being designed but increasingly by that point i suppose ireland had been subdued mm -hmm. like the norman invasion i think it's fair to say was never a complete invasion it was no. at its maximum reached maybe 75 percent of the island and then yeah. went into retreat mm -hmm. but certainly after the cromwellian conquest you're talking about mopping up operations maybe into the yeah. and then obviously by the end of the, of the 17th century yeah. uh the defeat uh, or uh, the victory of william of orange i think really copper fastens a new period That's of irish right. history yeah. but i suppose these frontiers that we've talked about that really had considerable differences 
start to melt away or lack the importance that they would once have had, like mm-hmm. crossing the, the distance we have mm-hmm. in this podcast by, I don't know, 1750, for example, you're not moving, you're moving within the same country, yeah. within the same legal system, really. Um, whereas in previous times, you would have actually noticed, like you talked earlier, considerable differences yeah. over short periods of time. And maybe at the last site, which is a 1798 battlefield, that might be a, an opportunity to talk about, I suppose, the emergence of modern Ireland. From Kilcash, we went to our final stop along the Lingon Valley, a place called Carrig Maclear, the site of a battle in 1798. While this has a fascinating story attached to it, it also helps understand why the Lingon Valley is not really that significant in modern Ireland. People might be able to hear at home, Neil, I'm out of breath. We've walked <laughs> up quite a steep hill. We're at Carrig Maclear, and this is a 1798 battle site. And I think that's going, it's going to be a quite, maybe a, a nice conclusion to the journey we've taken along what was an ancient frontier. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about what happened here? It's just to let people know there's absolutely stunning views. If you are in the area and you kind of follow our footsteps, definitely come up here for the views alone. There's a stunning view of the Golden Vale. But sorry, Neil, no, take it, it away and let me catch my breath <laughs> over here. It, it is a beautiful location. It is a very steep hillside it really is it's a bit of a walk after the nice lowlands down below um and you know you got a big marion cross up here as well that was put in i think in the 1950s or 60s but like it is this very prominent location and it's because of that that the engagement was here you see this is the site of the only as far as i'm aware and you know no expert on this period but I think it's the only military engagement in County Tipperary in 1798. And what was supposed to happen is that there was supposed to be a big beacon fire lit on top of this hill, which was then the signal for the whole rebellion to, to kick off across this part of Tipperary. You can imagine if there is a fire up here, it would be visible for, 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 for miles, miles and miles, and miles yeah. around. You've got such an elevated position. So this big beacon was supposed to kind of raise everybody to arms and, and send everyone out. but. Unfortunately, the the rebels were uh, betrayed by a local innkeeper and he lived in Nine Mile House and somebody talked too much in the pub, as as will happen. He informed a guy called William Despard of Kilahai Castle and he was the head of the local yeomanry. So he lit a fire on the hill to create a false signal before the real beacon was supposed to be lit and that lured everybody out into a trap. He was ready and waiting for them. Um, he made uh, contact with, beforehand with the British uh, forces in Kilkenny and they surrounded the hill, essentially. A, a good number, uh, I think several were killed actually in the engagement here. Uh, many more were arrested and then later taken away for execution. So they were betrayed for basically talking too loose in the pub, I think, unfortunately, and, and it was a pretty cunning trap that was stirred for them. And that became then the... I suppose the kind of pivotal moment in 1798. And when you look at the broader story of 1798, there became something that had such potential to change the country in a way. But each one of these individual actions, whether it was in Kildare, Wexford, here, uh, you know, or in Mayo, they kind of started with a bit of promise, but they were just the amount of informers, the amount of kind of. Um, traps that were set, that bit of kind of experience in some ways it, from the, the kind of the British forces in some of these areas. It just it just uh, snuffed each of these key threats out that they could never do a big coordinated uprising across the country all at once. Makes you think if this would have succeeded here, you know, if Kilda hadn't, you know, Fitzgerald hadn't been captured right at the beginning, what would have happened? at that point you know because there was a lot going for the uprising in the initial stages but it just I suppose it, it is that thing that people kind of often forget it is the largest uprising in modern Irish history like far larger than say like obviously say something like the 1916 rising or even yeah. probably those involved in the war of independence just the amount of people who participated and certainly the amount of people killed in the aftermath of it yeah. which ran into the tens of thousands I think yeah. but I think just we started off this 5,000 years ago up us. We didn't start 5,000 years ago, but... Uh, <laughs> Feels like it after walking <laughs> up that hill. <laughs> but yeah. over the course of that, we've visited various places where that frontier, for one reason or another, 
remained very important in the landscape. But up here, I guess in the aftermath, particularly in the 1798 rebellion, but it, it wasn't because of the 1798 rebellion. But as modern Ireland, and when I say modern Ireland, I'm taking that long view of 200, 250 years, <laughs> emerges, those traditional boundaries um, start to, that they no longer have the same meaning or resonance that they would once have had as new political, economic boundaries, I guess even, I suppose, the m most important boundary on the island of Ireland today is obviously the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't have a historical precedent. Obviously, in part, it follows the traditional border of Ulster, but it's a very much for forged by with modern considerations. And I think, I guess what I'm getting at is that this boundary though here mm -hmm. uh, that we followed kind of, I wouldn't say becomes obsolete. We mentioned the hurling connection that runs yeah. into the present. But it is an inter interesting thing about the modern world that I guess the rate of change in the last 200 years is becoming, in the long view, this really decisive moment in the history of this part of the world and that traditions that continued on for thousands of years, transcended cr the arrival of Christianity, are now losing that importance. Uh, absolutely. I mean, in a sense, all history is local. You know, uh, you know, even if it's a big momentous event, it still happened with the particular community around it. And borders and, and, and barriers like that, I think, are dependent on those communities to maintain them, in a sense. And when it no longer makes sense for those communities uh, to do so, uh, they, they go away fairly quickly. And, and in the case here, where we're looking at the Lingon Valley, you've definitely got this cultural boundary that has existed for, you know, certainly 5,000 years. And the fact that it's essentially just a county boundary now, and we look at a country like Ireland, and, and which was never, a th I, th I think it'd be fair to say, never a, a united country in its sense, apart from unless you want to call it under British Empire, I suppose, then it was under one edge, when you, mm. if you like, but it was never, it was always a place of boundaries and borders. And it, I, I think any time you find one of these borderlands, Take a look around you in the landscape because there's lots and lots of stories written on there because of that border. You know, we've seen everything from cultural boundaries with the high crosses and the passage tombs to, you know, military boundaries when we're looking at things like, the, you know, Kilcash Castle and, and now up here with 1798 and, and, you know, the beacon that would have been written up here as well. So I think wherever you find these border territories, they're interesting places and they continue to be interesting places, even when the particular border disappears. Yeah, for sure. Because you can even see it in other parts of the country, like yeah. in West Mead, say the old boundaries between the Old Kingdom and Mead and Leinster and Connacht, yeah. you get that similar um, material culture because of that friction point in the landscape that you do get like plenty to explore, as you say. Yeah. But uh, I'm going to put in the show notes of this uh, where we've been today. Uh, it's definitely worth people coming and uh, follow, checking out these places because each one has so much to see. You know, even, as I said, the, the views from up here are stunning. Well, yeah, and we, you know, I love this place. I mean, it, it's only up the road from me in Clonmel and, uh, and, you know, where you've got this concentration of monuments. So we've only scratched the surface, you know, mm. there's many more high crosses and prehistoric tombs and lots of standing stones and stuff like that. Uh, as well, but we'd be at it <laughs> constantly, <laughs> you know. Um, For 5,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> but we, what we what I tried to do with the, the kind of the adventure we got to it is to help people find these places. So we made an itinerary map, actually, which has the coordinates and instructions on how to find these things and the significance of them, and of some of the best of the sites as well. And I, I'll have to give you a link that if you want Great, to Great, I'll put that, put that in the show notes. And do you have yeah. any podcasts from the, that would relate to any of the sites we've covered today or even yeah. the general areas that, you know, people could maybe listen to? Yeah. as they're coming along well we've got lots of articles as well so for sites like uh, Henny and Knockrow and things like that so people can read a little bit more about the history of these places and the significance of what was found archaeologically in terms of podcasts uh, I have two in particular that kind of jump out as recommendations I did a really interesting one just before the last winter solstice with Marissa Sullivan talking about the Lingon Valley in, in general, but more specifically about Knockrow okay. and his excavations there. And we talk about the significance of this landscape, how interesting it is. So I think that that's a really good discussion. And because this area is so, I, I suppose, 
uh, resplendent with high crosses. The one with Roger Staley talking about, uh, you know, because I, I always bring up the Ossery crosses whenever I'm talking to somebody who knows the stuff about them because I'm so interested in that question about are they particularly old or are they just a different cultural expression because they do look so different to the rest of the high crosses on the island. So those two in particular, I think people would hopefully get a little kick I think out. it is definitely worth, though, probably listening to that, reading the articles, because you do get so much more out mm. of places like this. Because sometimes what you're trying to appreciate is the landscape. It's yeah. not necessarily something immediately in front of you. No. It's that broader. And hopefully a bit of what we've talked about today will convey that uh, to you at home. If you are, and even if you're overseas, on Tua, you'll be able to, on Neil's website, you'll be able to, and I'll have links to that in the show notes as well, you'll be able to see an awful lot of what we're talking about. Absolutely. I'm going to leave it there. Neil, thanks very much for joining me today. And uh, no doubt uh, people will uh, catch up with you on Amplify Archaeology and hopefully you'll be back on the show again uh, without before too long. Uh, absolutely, Finn. It's always a pleasure going wandering around a few old monuments <laughs> on a nice sunny day like today. That's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks, Finn. I'd like to thank Neil for his time. You can check out links to his podcast and that service he operates, tua.ie, in the show notes below. Sound on today's episode was by Kate Dunley. Until next time, Sloan.